I'm just leaving home now, and I was wondering if he had any calls for me. It has been described as one of the truly great steps in the history of technology. The handheld wireless communication device, which is probably not too far away from you right now. We believe that this was a tool for people and for all people. We had uh, visions like you know, people going to work could actually make useful calls instead of wasting their time in traffic jams. Mobile technology has helped remove dictators from power. It has transformed conditions for developing nations. Google reported that they have already invested in several companies, including... And it has become a battleground for the business world's largest corporations. The emergence of mobile technology really has created a whole other part of the economy. What he was really showing was a barely working prototype. And here it is. But the mobile phone also affects us as humans. Our most important kinds of cultural negotiations, sharing and communication happen, are really, really transforming themselves. I couldn't put it down. I, you know, I, I literally was frantic if I didn't look at my phone for 10 minutes. Our social behavior is changing before our very eyes. I'm on my phone, my wife's on the phone, my kids are on their devices, and we are not talking to each other. This is the story of how the mobile phone was created and how it changed everything. The small town of Green Bank, West Virginia. A seemingly ordinary place in the Western world, complete with shops, a school, and a couple of restaurants. Sports fields, uh, playgrounds. It's a very small town. Um, everybody knows everybody. You know, you know your neighbors, you help your neighbors. It's, it's more like a very large extended family. You may not notice immediately what is different about Green Bank, but it soon becomes obvious. Green Bank, what makes it special for, for people from the outside is that we don't have cell phone service here in Green Bank itself. This is the quiet zone. The national radio quiet zone. Uniquely for our modern world, there are no mobile phones in Green Bank. And no service. No service. The reason for that is the large radio telescope nearby. A mobile-free zone has been set up in order to avoid interference with the collecting of scientific data. The radio quiet zone was created to help protect man-made radio signals from interfering with observations. It really hasn't been a problem until more recently. As technology increased, namely wireless technologies, it certainly became a problem for radio astronomy. They've got a truck down there that they've got an antenna on it. And they drive around. We've got one man drives that truck around, and he'll stop, pinpoint whatever's causing the problem. The people of Green Bank are free to use computers and landlines in their homes. Wireless technology, however, is not allowed. These are actually Wi-Fi modems uh, that are, you know, somebody has these set up in their homes, you know, it is, it is against the law to have that. It is uh, absolutely a unique area. There is no other area in the world like the National Radio Quiet Zone. There are conveniences such as cell phones, uh, wireless technologies that the people can't have. 
and it's a different place to live because of that. Like for example, yesterday, would it, it would have been great to have cell phone coverage. I was stuck behind an automobile accident for an hour and could not let anyone know why I was late for work because I'm in the middle of an accident. It, it's, a big, it's a big problem in a way, but in a way it isn't a problem because we're used to not having cell phones. You might think Green Bank's young residents would have a different attitude towards the quiet zone. But neither Jacob Johnson nor Alex Rodriguez has been adversely affected by growing up without mobile phones. No, definitely not. I saw my cousins grew up with cell phones and I always saw them like completely attached to them while we were at any kind of family gathering or anything like that. You didn't, you weren't entangled in it. You'd go outside and play. He was more active without the phone. Green Bank is like a real life museum of what the world used to be like. Not too long ago, we all lived this way. In a matter of only a few decades, we left behind a world where you needed to be in specific spots to communicate with other people. The cell phone is important because it cut the umbilical cord of each person to the home or office. The mobile phone is now an integral part of our lives, in a way few could have foreseen. The human being and this brain of ours, for the first time in history, can instantly connect to any other communication in the world, and that is profound indeed. But our modern, fully mobile and constantly connected lifestyle seems to come at a cost. The expectations placed upon us to be more productive and constantly accessible are higher, not least from employers. There's a whole economy that is built up around the mobile technology as a result of being able to be constantly in touch with our our workplaces. The expectation is that you will be using your phone for email, you'll be using your phone uh, to work when you're sitting in a waiting room rather than reading a, a magazine. Most would agree that our free time and our interaction with each other has also been affected by the mobile phone. We are seeing more and more children and parents all on their devices, not interacting, not gaining all the benefits that come from face-to-face -face real contact. Growing up today is the first generation of people who have never experienced a world without mobile phones, who were basically born with a device in their hands and who are reluctant to let it out of their sight. Young people now average seven and a half hours of media use per day. I think it's a huge transformation. And the reality is that so much of what makes us human are being channeled through these communication devices. And with the mobile, it's a device that's with us. It's on our bodies 24-7. Uh, that can't not change what it means to you know, be a part of the social and cultural world. In order to grasp how such a small device could change the world so radically, we need to go back in time and find out how it gradually acquired more and more of its functions. You prefer to wait or something? Well, I am pretty busy at the moment. Call me back, please. The idea of mobile telecommunication is an old one. This 100-year-old picture from a German publication portrays a future where phone calls can be made and received while out and about. The first thing resembling mobile telecoms came around 1920 in Germany, where they hooked up trains to telephone posts along the railway. Naturally, the phone became even more mobile when it was put in cars, which was first done in America after World War II. The equipment needed to make a call claimed most of the space in the boot. Mama, mama put the cat out tonight, cat out tonight. But in order for telecoms to become truly mobile and accessible to the general public, two things needed to happen. The phones had to get much smaller, and the issue of capacity needed to be addressed. Space on the radio spectrum had reached its limit. This was the reception area. 
Not sure what they're doing here now, but they're apparently tearing it all apart. And of course, again, the main thing you would see that was so different is you would see thousands of people scurrying around doing their daily work. It was like a city. Richard Frankiel returns to his old place of work, Bell Labs, New Jersey. When the Bell Laboratories at Murray Hill, New Jersey was built, this campus plan was an advanced progressive departure from the common... These now vacant buildings saw the development of the cellular technology, the very backbone of today's mobile telecoms. What was before was a system with a high-powered transmitter in the middle of a city, one site in the middle at a high building covering the whole city. Cellular was tens or hundreds of small cells that covered the same area. And the whole point of cellular was that you could reuse channels. A channel used here could be used five miles away for a different conversation. There wasn't enough radio spectrum to go around, and the cell phone, the cellular idea, was a way of sharing out that frequency so that everyone could have a radio telephone. We were able to achieve what was called locating and handoff, to hand the call off to another cell. So you could keep driving and driving from cell to cell to cell, and the system would move the call with you. And that was the key. With the infrastructure in place, the time had come for a new player to enter the stage. Motorola, they realized that while AT&T was working on the network piece, someone had an opportunity to really build the handsets, the devices that people would carry around. We decided to take AT&T on, and that's where I had the idea that how can a small company in Chicago take on the biggest company in the world? We have to do something dazzling. So the first people I approached were our, the industrial designers. I said, really, we are going to build a handheld personal telephone, a cellular phone. He says, what's a cellular phone? They, they called it the shoe because it looked like a, uh, like a shoe. This is Dynatech, the very first portable phone intended for commercial market. Very heavy and very basic. Oh, you can talk and listen, and one is uh, hang up and uh, call. Martin Cooper headed up the development of the phone. My lab is in disarray mostly because I don't... He was also the very first person in the world to make a mobile phone call. Yes, Martin Cooper's call from in 1973 is often cited as the first cellular telephone call. In, in fact, it's, it's very much an experimental um, setup. So in 1973, a Motorola executive named Martin Cooper came here to New York in Manhattan with what he called a mobile phone. Uh, it was barely mobile. Uh, the nickname was the shoe phone, and it really was about the size of a large man's shoe. New Yorkers are normally very blasé. They, they see right through you, and then here's this guy talking on what appeared to be a telephone with no wires. And there were people with their mouths hanging open. Because remember, this is 1973, there were no cordless phones, no cell phones, so uh, we made quite a fuss. He makes a call to, to a journalist who's amazed that he's crossing a road in 1973 making a telephone call, and it is demonstrating that the cellular idea works. In fact, while I was talking to the journalist, I stepped into the street and he had to pull me back and that was a historical moment because for the first time that a person with a cell phone almost got hit by a New York taxi. Our first goal was to create a car phone system for convenience. But when companies like Motorola, uh, people like Marty Cooper, when they got us to the pocket phone, it really was a tremendous expansion of what cellular could be. They saw this as solving the car telephone problem. We believe that this was a tool for all people. We discovered then that mobility was not 
adequate if it was only in a car. Mobility meant you had to be everywhere. Despite America being the birthplace of cellular technology, the country fell behind other parts of the world from the start. Due to complicated rules and regulations, it would take many years before the American mobile telecom market hit its stride. I mean, we were the world leaders in cellular in the 70s, and by the 80s, um, we didn't even have an operating commercial system and other countries were putting them in. So yes, we lost years by our inability to solve political problems. Instead, the major breakthrough for mobile phones took place somewhere else entirely. Here in Lapland, there are so long distances between people, so you really need mobile phones and this mobile communication to survive. Here, in the northernmost part of Europe, mobile phones experienced their first major surge, thanks to a unique collaboration between several countries. Something very interesting happens in the Nordic countries. There, radio engineers from different countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway and Finland, were able to come together and agree a standard for how these telephones, these cell phones were going to work. You could communicate uh, even up here on the fjells and then on the sea and from car to car. So it was really, really functional. And uh, the standard was so good that, that um, we had coverage all over Finland and, and Scandinavia. And actually that becomes a model for cell phone networks that cross borders that enable you to go from country to country to roam. And it is quite a contrast to what happens in the United States where each city is basically allowed to set up its own cell phone network. The joint Nordic effort, NMT, was for a while the world's largest mobile system and paved the way for a future giant in the industry. Nokia are a company from the 19th century and they do everything. They make paper, they make rubber. So not what you might expect to become a real cutting edge electronics firm in the late 20th century. Nokia becomes the unlikely early leader in the tale of mobile phones. The company owes most of its success to this man. Nobody at home. Ah! <laughs> the distinguished company's new CEO, Jorma Olila, suggests taking a risky new path, entering a new era of technology. Olila wants Nokia to lead the transition from analog to digital telephony. So when you have a digital phone, you can do things other than just transmit voice. You can transmit data. If you look at the dominant competitors, Motorola, the Japanese, Ericsson, which was bigger than Nokia, they felt that analog has a long way to run, that it's actually pretty good, and that the digital will come later. We were a youngster, but uh, we realized in about 91, 92 that this is an opportunity because it's a disruption. So we can jump into a new level if we are the first one in GSM. Jorma Olila's suggestion is an extremely bold move. So you, yeah, yeah, the palms were sweating. It's a gamble in a way. If it hadn't worked, the company would have gone bust. But it did work spectacularly and they become the most important mobile phone handset maker. <laughs> yes. This yes. was the model that first showed that Nokia was on to something big. Because that was the big seller and everybody realised that GSM is for real. The selling forecast was 400,000 over the life. We sold 20 million. The Nokia 2110 introduced a function that would irreversibly change phone communication, even for youngsters. Oh, 
This is the one that exploded text messaging market because it was the first phone that supported the easy way of writing the messages. It was launched uh, 1994 and uh, 95, 96 were the years when uh, text messaging exploded as a business. Matti Mäkkinen was the first person in the world to send a text message between phones. What the message said, however, he has quite forgotten. I don't remember. Not related to business. It was something like hello between two people or something like that. I don't remember. SMS was the first of the applications of a phone that was quite different from just talking on a phone. It's, it's the first step away from the phone being a device for one use to being a general purpose device. Nobody could have anticipated just how huge texting would become. When we started to think, of, think about the text messaging, of course the first application we had in our minds was business purposes. They thought, well, what might it be used for? It might be used by engineers who've got to send a, a message back to base. But, and this is something we find in history of technology quite often. It's often the users who discover what a technology is really for, and text messaging is a good example of that. Up until the mid-90s, the mobile phone had been an accessory for businessmen. Now everyone was using it, especially young people. And the reason why teenagers took to mobile technologies so rapidly and with such enthusiasm is because you're either in school, where you have adults kind of observing you all the time, or you're at home where you have private space, but you don't really have a channel for private communication. The mobile phone completely changed all that because it was the first time that young adults, teenagers, could have private, unmonitored communication directly with one another. They could be texting under their desk, they're not making any noise, they're not being overheard, and that's why it just became an explosive combination. For the first time, questions were suddenly being raised about the mobile phone perhaps not being an altogether positive thing. More and more people grew concerned with the possible dangers of radiation. And this new texting function, what was it doing to young people's grammar? But there was more to be concerned about. The next function making its way onto the mobile phone would affect us even more. The very first camera phone was born in Japan in the year 2000. <laughs> it gave us new ways to express ourselves and to degrade others. Happy slapping, a social phenomena that began in England. Basically, someone assaults a stranger while being recorded on a camera phone that will go viral on the internet. The explosion of posted pictures of sunsets and table settings, not to mention selfies, was all down to the mobile phone. But it soon became apparent that there were more important ways to use the camera phone. Terror came to London today in the heart of the rush hour. It was aimed at ordinary people. Oh, this is probably one of the biggest stories I've, I've ever worked on. Um, and it was even more dramatic because this, is one, this was when we were getting uh, information from people on the ground about what was going on in a way that we'd never had that before. Ladies and gents, we need to clear now Russell Square. The London Underground bombings on July the 7th, 2005, were the cause of national trauma, but were also the starting point for a new way to cover news events. The scene here was fire engines parked all the way down here, um, am uh, ambulance medics running up and down. We arrived here, uh, we formed up. This just here was absolute chaos. We had um, 20 to 30 people being tended to by doctors and medics, and this whole area was covered in casualties. Pretty shocking. 
Hello. All right, thanks. Sergeant Pete Burton of the Transport Police remembers the day vividly. Okay, come on. There was a lot of chaos. There was lots happening on the radio. Uh, we had a device that went off up between Aldgate and Liverpool Street in the City of London. Uh, and at the same time, near about a device that went off at Edgware Road, the other side of London, in the west of London. At the BBC News Desk, people were equally bewildered. So at nine o'clock, we have a morning meeting. There'd been some whispers of something going on on the underground as we were going into that meeting. And at about 20 past nine, the front page editor of the day came into the meeting, just, just broke up the meeting, said, actually, I think this, this tube thing is a lot bigger than it sounds. We, we probably need to get onto it. I think they're in here. Yeah, here they are. First to reach the BBC from the general public were emails. At 9.55, the first email that came in was, I'm at London Bridge and have just seen three unmarked police cars and three ambulances rush past me in the direction of Liverpool Street. Not sure what's going on. This is a customer service update. There are good service the atmosphere is very eerie, um, a very strange atmosphere, a smell of chemicals from the explosion. What you have to do at the scene of any terrorist attack is check the area that you're working in in case they put another bomb. So we search through the bodies for... If, in case uh, they had a partially activated or a secondary device. Be careful. After eyewitness accounts via email, footage from the underground started coming in. Around about half past 11, a picture that came into, came into our, our inbox that kind of defined the day and defined the significance and the role of, of user-generated content in, in, in one image, frankly. I was, I was stunned when I, when I saw that particular image, when I saw the image of the guys walking down the tunnel, you know, away from the darkness of the, of, of, of the tunnel of the tube and, and, and the chaos and confusion of what was going on down the tunnel. It really summed up, you know, what was going on at the time in, in an incredibly powerful way. There's one particular image that became almost the canonical expression of the new citizen journalism, which was a very poor quality image, greenish tinged, bad resolution, but what mattered was that it was authentic. For the first time, you can see images like the, 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 the picture being incorporated into our main core journalism. That was a major breakthrough. Citizen journalism and mobile phones were made for each other because the ability of people who are now carrying media creation devices around in their pockets to see things and to record them and to get them out to the world uh, is uh, unprecedented in human history. To see the bomb go off, to see the waves coming over the hotel with the, with the Asian tsunami. The only way you're going to get to see those kind of images firsthand is if you've got somebody there with a mobile who are able to take, who's able to take images. What you saw on those camera phones, although slightly blurred, was the feeling you felt when you went down there. Exactly. It was eerie, it was dark, it was, um, yeah, fairly distressing. The next step of the mobile evolution, coupling the phone with the internet, became the holy grail of the telecom industry in the new millennium. All major companies launched phones that were more or less smart. But on January the 9th, 2007, when this man stepped up onto the stage, they all suddenly had one thing in common. They were all outmoded. The man's name is Steve Jobs. He is the CEO of Apple. And in his pocket is a device the world has never seen before. The story of how the first modern smartphone came to be starts in Silicon Valley, just south of San Francisco. So right now we're at the corner of um, De Anza Boulevard and Mariani Avenue and all the people that you see crossing the street are all people who work at Apple. Here in Cupertino, on the street Infinite Loop, 
Steve Jobs assembled a team for a classified project in the mid-2000s. So this is, uh, this is number two, Infinite Loop. On the first floor is uh, Apple's uh, design studio um, run by Johnny Ive, and on the second floor is where most of the iPhone was developed. Fred Vogelstein is a technology reporter with many years on the telecom beat, who has written a book about Apple. Still, he has hardly ever been allowed past the company's lobby. Um, Apple's very secretive about uh, how they run things, and uh, most of the people who work at Apple have never actually been uh, inside many of the offices in Building 2. The team that was about to guide the company into a whole new business area set up headquarters on the other side of these windows. Every month, it seemed, there was a new part of the floor that was taken over by the super secret project team. And if you weren't getting sucked into the project yourself, it was hard not to feel bad. Not only was the iPhone a super secret project within Apple, but it was also siloed within the iPhone team. The people who were working on the hardware, they weren't allowed to see what the finished product looked like. Really, the only person was Steve Jobs who could see over the wall. Andy Gringen was a member of the team. He remembers the working climate clearly. Idea about how to solve the problem as well. We would tell people, like, you are going to work, you're going to give up your nights and weekends, which we all did. Uh, you're going to have to work holidays. I mean, we had people working on Christmas Day, Christmas Eve Day. I mean, it was really stressful. But on the other hand, you know, there was a group of people that thrived on it because it gave you a chance and kind of like micro milestones to deliver. And once you did it, there was a whole new rush of adrenaline. All right, let's go do the next. It's time to take the next hill. Steve Jobs had several people work simultaneously on the same issue and compete for the best solution. Competition, you know, certainly in Steve's eye, was always a great thing, right? So we had people that were, you know, from different organizations competing for the same exact piece of hardware, the same exact project. We built different versions of it, but Steve wanted that choice. And he picked the right one. I think we can all agree it was, was pretty successful. Jobs unveiled the iPhone at Macworld in uh, early January 2007. Um, he walked onto the stage and said, this is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. And he laid out each of these devices in the slides that he was showing everybody. And it was only after that buildup that he said, an iPod, a phone, <laughs> and an internet communicator. An iPod, <laughs> a phone. Getting it? These aren't three devices, they're one device. Um, and we call it iPhone. Today, on the day of the now classic today, iPhone presentation, only a few people were aware that the phone was actually far from ready. The reality was that the engineers who were working on who had been working on the iPhone were sitting in the fifth row so nervous that the demo was going to fail that they were doing shots of scotch. You know, it started off as a survival mechanism, it felt like, right? Your gut's churning. There's only so much stress you can take, especially leading up to, uh, to an event like that. And so we brought a 750 ml bottle of, of Johnny Walker Blue. There was a good reason why they were so nervous. During the previous five days of rehearsals, Jobs had been unable to get through without the iPhone crashing. In fact, the phone was so barely functional that the only way that the phone would work is if Jobs did the demonstration in a very specific order that they actually called the golden path. And to unlock the phone, I just take my finger and slide it across. All right, you want to see that again? You got to see the actual uh, hardware as it existed at the time. Uh, and the software was all there. But what you didn't get to do was just do anything you wanted. And that's what the golden path was. The golden path was what software did you run, in what order, and how long did you linger? And so if I want to get in the iPod, I just go down that lower right-hand corner and push this icon right here, and boom, I'm in the iPod. 
I want to get home. Every time Jobs finished a part of the demo that one of the engineers was responsible for, he did a shot. And, and that's how we got through the demo. They figured, well, um, at least we'll be drunk. The iPhone introduced a series of innovations that set a new standard for all phones to come. Steve Jobs was determined that you'd never use a stylus. He said, you've got 10 styluses and also no buttons. The single button is on and off. Uh, everything else is going to be accessed to how you touch the phone. The iPhone was truly disruptive in many ways. Everything up until then had been a voice device that had a sort of uh, tacked on internet experience. Steve Jobs, when he presented the iPhone for the first time, what he revealed was a truly multimedia experience. On the other side of the world, Nokia watched the presentation and was not impressed. A lot of competitors simply thought that it was a toy, that it was um, a flash in the pan. What they missed was the power of design. BlackBerry, Microsoft, and Nokia all had very utilitarian devices, and everybody wanted an iPhone. Three, two, one, when it actually went on sale, it was as if the Beatles had come to town. I mean, people spent the night waiting to buy a cell phone. Nobody had seen anything like that before. The major telecom players would soon realize that the future was as Steve Jobs had imagined. The old giants were replaced by new ones. Could we have done more in Nokia? Sure, we could have. But could we have, could, could, would that have been enough? I don't know. Within the space of a few months, a wide variety of tools and applications migrated to the smartphones. We suddenly had a constant companion as versatile as a Swiss Army knife. The most important new functions were perhaps the localization tools. Suddenly we could see exactly where we were and how to get where we were going. And more intriguingly, the phones could find each other. Okay, so I've got jacked, I've got scruff. So I just uh, complimented his picture, just said hello and we'll see if we get a little response back. He's online right now. I have been in a relationship off of this app before. Okay. Didn't last very long. <laughs> So-called dating apps, smartphone applications that match up individuals, have completely transformed the way we meet partners. Oh, I think that cell phones have changed dating completely. People are very immediate, and technology has allowed them to have that immediate satisfaction, and that's what the online dating apps provide. Today, countless dating apps make use of the smartphone's positioning technology. Grindr was launched in 2009 for gay people and popularised the phenomenon. You log on and you see who's around you. Uh, maybe you see someone attractive nearby, you say hello. Online dating apps essentially allow you to create a profile and then see people who are in a relatively near radius of you. You then are set up with them and matched with them, and you can send text messages between the two of you to begin communicating. I mean, that was a fun transition because, you know, it adds another layer to just being on, you know, a website where you don't really know how far away people are. In the Castro in San Francisco, Users of the app are never far away. Here's my phone. You just click on it, and you can search by nearby. And here's all the people that are in the Castro right now. 0, 0.0 miles away. So I, that's very close. It's basically right here. Can't get close. <laughs> Regardless of sexuality, the mobile phone has made online dating a people's movement and helped erase the stigma formerly associated with it. Absolutely, there has been a significant degree 
of stigma that's been reduced. Between 2009 and 2011, online dating was the second most common way that people met a prospective marriage partner. I think that the issue that people have really begun to understand is that technology had become so much more integrated into our daily lives that using a phone to find somebody would not be unusual because they're also banking or shopping online or paying their taxes and they're doing everything else online. This new way of meeting has created a new type of dating behavior. I mean, what I'll do sometimes is um, just say hi to like three or four people at a time and then it's like, fishing, right? So whoever grabs the bait, you talk with them for a little while and see what happens. It's a new era. People don't take time to get to know the other person anymore. With online dating apps, people have a shopping mentality where they can just sign on again and go look for another girl or another guy. How is your conversation coming along? Poorly. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not very desirable. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great stuff. The technology used in all positioning apps is very simple. Some consider this a problem. Hi, welcome to EFF. Hi, Seth, thanks for having us over. Seth Schoen at the Electronic Frontier Foundation claims that we willingly walk around with a device that gives out more information about ourselves than we might like. Mobile devices are probably the biggest threat to privacy in some sense today, particularly in terms of people's locations, people's physical whereabouts. Let's get some altitude. This drone, hovering above London's Hyde Park, illustrates how content from our phones could end up in the wrong hands. So all of these people mulling around us here, um, the software is currently detecting their mobile phones, and I can uniquely identify them. So I can track individuals through essentially space and time. And then we can also um, do more malicious and potentially illegal things. One of the simplest ways of protecting your phone against intruders is to turn off the Wi-Fi function whenever you leave the house. Now, if you've left your Wi-Fi on, which through our experience, the vast majority of people do, your device is constantly looking for every mobile network you've ever connected to. So it's shouting out, hey, Starbucks, are you there? Um, hey, McDonald's free Wi-Fi, are you there? Um, I'm not doing it now because it's, it's very illegal, but I could convince people's mobile phones to connect to the wireless access point running on this device. So I could pretend to be McDonald's free Wi-Fi, they wouldn't even notice, and they'll just be browsing away, and I'll be intercepting all of their data. And it's, it's got yeah. a camera as well. Yeah, so it's got two cameras. I fly over the park because it's legal, but if I was a bad guy, I could fly over the city mm. and just harvest everyone's data from down below. What kind of data do you get, like? Uh... Whatever you're browsing or apps you're using, I intercept your data and then I can grab your usernames, passwords, credit cards, uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, the actual data that you... Commercial forces are also interested in your phone's Wi-Fi connection. So actually, as we walked down the street just now, we walked past a business on this block that uses that to detect uh, statistical information about customers who come into that business. There's a little sticker there saying, oh, we use Euclid Analytics. The equipment required to gather information from our mobile phones is very cheap and accessible, which essentially makes this phenomenon impossible to control. Because I have a little Wi-Fi adapter for my laptop that has the ability to do the same thing that this company does. And I bought that for about 20 or $30. What other sensors are there on this street or in a hospital or placed by a government or on a drone that are collecting the same information that haven't even bothered to put up a little sticker? So let's have a quick preliminary look and see what we managed to find. Well, quite a few devices. So in that short period, we're flying for what, maybe 10 or 15 minutes and uh, managed to get 378 devices. There are other techniques, but we focus on Wi-Fi because it's currently the easiest. And hackers or criminals, they always take the path of least resistance. Now, it seems that at least 300 people today in the park have left their Wi-Fi on. We haven't done anything malicious with them, um, but we could have attacked those 300 mobile phones, got data from all of them. And have you left your Wi-Fi on, per chance? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've left it on, then you're in my database. 
average person has no idea. Um, and they see it, and you start to explain it to them, and you can see when their face changes, and they start to get a little bit worried, and they realize how easy it is and how it can be done to them. In a worst case scenario, a nation's government could use mobile technology to spy on its people. Say, for example, there's a friendly protest downtown and they could fly a couple of these devices and just detect everybody who's down below and make a note, uh -huh, okay, these 5,000 mobile phones were at this demonstration. Note for later. The recent really dramatic example that we had is the Maidan Square in Ukraine. People who were present there on a certain day all received a text message uh, saying, Dear subscriber, you have been registered as a participant in a mass disturbance. Not only did the government have the technical ability to find out who was present in that square on that day by means of the cell phone, but that it had actually done so and that it already knew who they were. That's a very intimidating thing. In order to avail ourselves of the efficiency and comforts of a mobile phone, we may have sacrificed part of our integrity. They also reveal which pairs of people were present at the same time, at the same place. If we were having some kind of meeting that we didn't want the public to know about, whether it's a business meeting or an activist meeting or a medical consultation that's supposed to be confidential, the cell phone network automatically observes the fact that we were at the same place at the same time. There might even be more downsides to the mobile revolution both psychologically and socially. You know, life is, has changed demonstrably in so many ways. Um, there are thousands of examples of, of what life was like before mobile phones. And in some ways, uh, I think we've lost a little bit of the uh, social mores that accompanied a pre-cell phone world. I'm on my phone, my wife's on the phone, my kids are on, the, on their devices, and we are not talking to each other. I do think they are incredibly addictive, really, as technologies. There appears to be something quite addictive about the portable little device. Studies suggest that we check our phone, on average, 150 times a day. The total time of interaction with our phones adds up to 119 minutes, more than we spend with our partners. 75% of people take their phones into the bathroom. Just as many spend the night within easy reach from it in the bedroom. And 84% state that they would not last a full day without it. The first signs are now emerging that our phone behaviour might lead to real problems. Located in the mountains above Seattle in the USA, we find the Restart treatment facility, which treats people who have lost control over their use of technology and developed an addiction. So here is um, an area that is just available to the guys and that's our public phone booth where they can make calls home. This is the most advanced piece of communication technology at Restart. Yes, that's our phone. <laughs> yeah, no TV, <laughs> no computers, no cell phone, no electronics. First thing, like, oh, I can do this. Second day, I kind of want to get on a system. That third day, oh, <laughs> can I play do something? It just, it really does suck. The hardest to adapt to was not having, was, was, was the access to the, the information superhighway, as they used to say. Uh, and that phrase makes me sound old. This is all CrossFit equipment and we have another room of it. It's important that they leave everything behind because we are putting them through a detox. Many of these guys have had a long history of being physically isolated in front of a screen and their social life has mostly been conducted online through gaming and social networking and that kind of thing and texting on their phones. 
Here, they are face to face. They don't have any of those screens to mediate their social interaction. That's why no one goes to see movies anymore, is because they're so freaking expensive and you can just watch them. Yeah. <laughs> it was hard adjusting to things here. Uh, I was really shy when I first got here. I didn't talk like at all. Now I'm like pretty talkative uh, since being here. One group of people, typically young men, struggles with a general abuse of technology often derived from excessive gaming habits. The mobile phone has made the problem worse. You know, the, the, since the internet's like a 24-hour thing, like everyone's posting on it constantly, you just get this constant like feed of information. I guess that's kind of when I got addicted to, was like that, that stream of information. I kind of regret everything I've done over the past months. I spent too many hours doing stupid stuff. I mean, seriously. I, um... I knew I made a mistake when you drop out at least two colleges. I like, every, you know, every other minute I'd just pull it out and see what new thing would pop up on the internet or if I got a message. I was addicted to just kind of pulling my phone out and I think a lot of people do. They're always waiting on something to happen on the internet or with their friends, social media. Think of the addiction as something which is created by overstimulating the pleasure centers of the brain. And the mere sending of a text and anticipating what you're going to get back and then getting something back, that whole process is actually rewarding and it, and it releases a little squirt of dopamine into the brain. And that's just texting. So smartphones are little computers that you can carry around with you everywhere. The more intense the rewards are, the more quickly the brain gets addicted to it. That's the problem though, is you say, oh, I'll just turn it off, but it's kind of like, if you talk to an alcoholic and just said, oh, just throw away your beer, it doesn't solve the problem of having that addiction. The mobile phone has created new addiction terminology. Danny Bowman has been diagnosed as Britain's first selfie addict. I couldn't put it down. I, you know, I, I literally was frantic if I didn't look at my phone for 10 minutes. I was spending 10 hours a day in the mirror, taking lots of photos on my phone. I wanted to, to look perfect on my Facebook and on my, uh, on my Twitter. Even though I got some good comments, it wasn't enough, and I continued to take more and more and more and more photos. At his worst, Danny took more than 200 selfies every day. This is me age 16, um, just started my treatment. There does seem to be a trend of people getting quite caught up in, in uh, whatever it is that they post about themselves and their lives online. And they judge how they're being perceived by how many likes they're getting and, you know, the comments that people make. And I think a lot of teenagers feel like this, that they're always seeking for approval. They're always seeking to say, you know, look at my life. Look how amazing my life is. Look how beautiful I am. Um, and that's the type of, of uh, lifestyle we live in now. And, and unfortunately, that can be very detrimental to many people. In pursuit of the ultimate selfie, he saw the underbelly of social media. I had about 3,700 Facebook friends. And it felt great, because I thought I was really popular. But and then I found out that people could be very cruel. There's all the comments, some not very nice ones. Some people used to call me gay and you look hideous. A comment just saying, ha ha. After a few weeks at Restart, the young men prepare for a life in which technology is not everything. You have to set goals for, for yourself once you leave. Yeah, just to help you whenever you leave Restart to keep on being healthy and not addictive to the... I'll, I'll be, like, deleting my apps, like, all my game apps and all the social apps on it and try to limit myself on, on that and just try to not spend hours on it. It's a very overreaching problem within, like, youth culture because, you know, we kind of dismiss it as, oh, I'm addicted to my phone and kind of laugh at it, but in reality, it kind of is like that. Like, people are on their phones constantly. There's a dark side to it, too, I think. 
We are, are developing a, a very addictive society that is addicted to speed. We have difficulty being introspective um, and interactive. And so for those people who think this is all a good thing, I don't agree. I think that we are uh, going too fast and not in the right directions. Anytime there has been a new technology or, and a new mode of communication introduced, there's always been a criticism of it. People were against motion pictures. Oh my God, what's gonna happen to our children? They sit all day in these danky dark theaters seeing motion pictures and they're just all gonna become morally bankrupt. So, you know, everything is a trade-off and it would be foolish to say that the cell phone and online communication is just 100% an advantage with no drawbacks. Everything in life is trade-offs. The key is, are the benefits more important than the disadvantages? The evening has come to Green Bank, the town where they live the way we all used to. Most people here regard the mobile free zone as a gift that has been given to them. I would never ever move. This is my home and I was born and raised here, I'll never leave. I mean, when you go places, you can be sitting right beside someone and they never raise their head from their cell phone. I think our kids relate a lot better to one-on-one -on -one face face-to-face contact. They can look you in the eye, they can speak to you. And I do think that, that having, not having a cell phone and having to relate like this, but having to relate like this is a big plus for them. Well, every time when I'm in coverage, I just have a constant need to check it all the time, see what's there. I mean, here, I just, I don't even think about it. It's not even in my mind, having to look at my phone. I'm, con I'm concentrating on everything else around me. I don't think it makes you dependent on it, but in a psychological way. You're not really dependent on it, or, or they couldn't be able to function here. They just think you're dependent on it. The mobile phone has altered the very core of our society but it is still too soon to tell what the long-term effects will be on us, the people. I think we're living through a really interesting transition. I mean, nobody would say that social connection and access to information is a bad thing. I mean, these are things that help us thrive as humans, but just like with the overconsumption of calories or when fats and sugars and salt suddenly became totally abundant, we had to start to create strategies for limiting access, for having healthy diets. And I think the same thing is happening with social connection and with information access and connectivity. Every technology brings problems. So it's only a question of, do you think technology is a good thing? And if you don't care, if you're content with your life, you don't need a cell phone. And you wouldn't give up your cell phone, would you?